Hi, it's Tarrant. And Stella from Meeple University. Today we'll be teaching you how to play the two expansions for Obsession, Upstairs Downstairs and Wessex, game by Dan Halligan and published by k Enter Games. We also have how to play video for the base game, link in the description below. Now let's get to the game. In this video, we'll be taking you through the Upstairs, Downstairs and Wessex expansions to Obsession, as well as some promotional content. Upstairs, Downstairs introduces some new mechanisms involving four new supplemental service types, and we'll be going through the new mechanisms that these bring into the game. But additionally, between the two, there's a number of additional cards, tiles and mechanisms that you can blend either with the expanded or base game. So first, let's take a look at what comes with these expansions and how to integrate it. Wessex is the simpler expansion. It comes with a new player board and starter cards for the Wessex family, giving you a fifth family that you can play in the base four player game. As a starting bonus, Wessex gets to take either a breakfast room or tennis court, indicated by this special starting icon in the corner, as a sixth starter estate improvement. The Wessex box alone is just a fifth family, not a fifth player. It does not come with the extra starting components you would need to play at five. It also comes with some new guest and improvement tiles, indicated by the W, that you can mix straight in with the base decks. With the Upstairs Downstairs expansion, you get another new family, the Howard family, including their starting cards. And you get two full sets of all of the standard starting components. As such, with Upstairs Downstairs alone, you can play five players, and with both expansions, you can play six. But the Howard family starter bonus is to gain one of the new servants, the Cook, which means that while Wessex can be integrated with the base game, Howard can only be played with the Upstairs Downstairs servant expansion. All the new expansion servants can be stored with the old ones in this new cloth bag and you'll lay out the appropriate ones in setup. The game comes with many new improvement tiles. These ones, all of the Prestige 5, aren't even marked as being part of Upstairs Downstairs. They can just be mixed straight in with the base game. They are new copies of pre-existing tiles. These five tiles are new to Upstairs Downstairs and do have the mark of the expansion, but they too can be mixed straight in with the base game whether you're playing the expansion or not. These three rooms activate or have an effect with one of the new expansion meeples, and so you can only use these when playing the expansion. The expansion comes with a new copy of four of the original game's six monument tiles, each of which is worth many fewer victory points than its copy. When setting up for either the base or upstairs downstairs game, you have a choice between using the lower scoring monuments or the higher scoring monuments. And you shouldn't mix and match. This option exists because some players felt that these had too much of an impact on the courtship phase of the original game, and so if you found this, you have this alternative. Finally for the tiles, there are two barns, two servants halls, and the builder's market reserve board extension. These components are specifically included for players who have the first edition of the base game. These tiles were changed between the first and second editions of the base game, and so if you have the first edition, remove your barn and servants halls and replace them with these. Likewise, the market reserve was added to the game for the second edition, and if you have the first edition, put this next to your central board to extend that board. You can leave these in the box or dispose of them if you have the second edition of the base game. There were some other rule changes between the first and second editions which didn't involve components, and all of those changes are explained here on pages 4 and 5 of the Upstairs Downstairs rulebook. Once again, if you own second edition, you can skip these pages. The new Upstairs Downstairs guest cards can be shuffled straight in with the base decks whether you're playing the expansion or not. There are no new mechanisms on these. These will help you make the decks go further if you're playing a high player count game. There are also new promotional guest cards in the expansion indicated by the letter P. These have a few new special rewards and different combinations. The designer recommends taking between three and five of these at random and then mixing them in with the base decks. All of these are compatible with both the base and upstairs downstairs expansions. 
there is an all new deck of objective cards indicated by the U in the top left corner. These two decks should not be mixed. You should only use the expansion deck with the expansion game and the base deck with the base game. There are new copies of the theme and victory point cards which are larger and you can use whichever size of card you'd prefer, otherwise the decks are identical. The new deck of milestone cards and these small family chits are used if you're using the milestone module and this is compatible with both base and expansion game with the exception of this specific milestone. There is a new round board and two new reputation chits used in the tableau variant of play. With the opposite side being identical to the extended play board from the second edition base game. Once again, this is provided for players who have the first edition. There's a few other bits and bobs like extension boards and player aids, but now let's get into the upstairs downstairs expansion. To set up, in addition to all of the normal base game servants, you'll add one of each of the four supplemental servant types per player. So for this three player game, you'd have three cooks, three hall boys, three head housemaids, and three useful men. Now you'll do a starting draft. Take one of each of these servants except for the underbutlers. In turn order, starting from the second player, players now draft both their family and one starting servant at the same time. So for example, the second player might choose York and a head housemaid. That drafted servant will join the player's normal five or six starting servants. Once all players have chosen, leftover servants go back to the servants for hire. You'll do this draft at the very start of initial setup. All of the rest of the setup steps are the same as the base game. Supplemental servants are hired during the game in the usual way, simply using the butler's room and hiring two servants from the supply. You have full choice between primary and supplemental staff when you take this action with the exception that you can never have more than one copy of the same supplemental staff. Howard would not have been able to hire a cook with this action. Once the butler's room has been flipped over to its back side, the option to recruit a servant from another player does not apply to the new supplemental staff. You can still only recruit ladies maids, footmen and valets with this tile if taking from another player. In some rare cases, the supplemental staff simply behave like the normal staff. They'll be required for a certain activity tile and you must move that staff member up to take that effect. But in most cases, you'll be spending them from your available service area onto cards or activity tiles which are already complete in order to enhance the rewards from those activities. The cook is all about helping you and giving you flexibility with reputation. And the cook has two effects, both of which may be resolved on the same turn. When you choose an activity tile, which as usual must be within your reputation level, you may place the cook onto it in addition to the staff it usually requires. This allows you to invite guests to this activity whose reputation is one or two outside your range. These guests are more inclined to come to a less prestigious family's event if they know they'll be well fed. Then the second benefit when you're gaining rewards is that the cook always grants you one reputation on top of all of that other activity's rewards. The reputation bonus occurs even if it's the cook activating the tile. The hall boy has three different functions and only one can be used on each activation. He may be added as supplemental service to a guest who has a money reward and doing so will increase that guest's money reward by £100. Alternatively, he could be substituted for the butler on a guest card with a mandatory butler service. This applies only to cards, not to tiles that require the butler. He does not generate any bonus money if he's used in this way. Thirdly, he may be used in place of a footman to activate the new carriage house tile which comes with upstairs downstairs. The head housemaid is somewhat similar. She has two different abilities and you can use one per activation. She can provide supplemental service to a guest who has a gain guest cards reward. 
when claiming that reward, you'll be able to draw one more card than you were required and then look at them before choosing the one you wish to keep. Or she can substitute for the housekeeper when providing compulsory service to a guest who requires it. Like the hall boy, the head housemaid can only be placed on cards, never on tiles. Finally, there is the useful man who has five different functions. Firstly, he may be placed on a tile at the start of your turn to treat its reputation level as if it is one lower than it is. So here, this player would be able to play this Prestige 3 building with a reputation of 2. Second, he may be spent from available service during the buy from market phase to get a £100 discount on any one tile you purchase. Thirdly, during a village fair round, he can be spent from your available service to your private study to get an additional £200 on top of any other village fair reward that you gain. For each of these options, you'll still take the rest of your turn sequence as normal, and the useful man will be expended at the end of the turn. Your fourth option is you can remove your useful man from the game, taking him from anywhere on your player board, even if already used this turn, to refresh the builder's market. Finally, you can remove your useful man from the game in the same way to sweep out the lowest cost improvement, slide the rest down, and look through the whole bag of tiles to find any single tile of your choosing, which you then put in the most expensive slot. This gives you a last ditch opportunity to get that single tile that you truly need, but at a high cost. This effect cannot be used to gain a monument. You can only ever have one useful man. If you remove yours from the game with either of these options, you cannot go back and hire another. If you purchase the base game's butler's pantry, then your underbutler can substitute for a hall boy, but not for a useful man. Upstairs Downstairs comes with a new flowchart for passing, which must be used with this expansion and may be used with the base game. The only difference is in this line here. Instead of collecting £200 or refreshing the builder's market, you now have a third option, which is to hire servants. If you do this, you'll go through all of the first steps, and then you'll use your butler's room exactly as you would if you were taking it on a normal turn. Place the butler's room in your activity slot, staff it with your butler, and then hire two servants. You can shop as usual, and then clear your board. This variant has a significant effect on the economy of passing in the game, whereas in the base game without this variant, pass turns would often be very weak and it would often be in your interest to have as few pass turns as possible. In this variant, it's a little bit easier to recover from having more passes and to strategically pass to get your more important guests back in hand. Upstairs Downstairs' other module is the Milestone module, which can be played with the expansion or base game. In setup, choose two cards from the milestone deck, and these will be objectives that players will be racing against each other to meet. On your turn, if you meet an objective, then you can place one of your family's chits onto the higher numbered space of the milestone, claiming it for final scoring. Only two players can claim each milestone per game. You can only claim one milestone per turn. If you qualify for both, choose one, and then hopefully the other one will still be there to claim next turn. Upstairs Downstairs expands Obsession to five or six players, although even the rulebook warns you that at six players, downtime can be pretty high. The servants are set up per the usual formula for five players, two underbutlers, two footmen per player, and one of everything else per player. No extra servants are added at six players, creating some scarcity. At both player counts, you'll use five monuments, as you would in the four-player game. With four or six players, you can play the competitive team mode, with each player partnering with the opposite player at the table. Players take their turns individually, but each player has some cooperative help they can get from their teammate on their turn. You can ask your teammate to give you one or two hundred pounds per turn. You could ask to use any of your teammates' available servants to use for either tiles or cards. 
The only exception being that you cannot use two of the same supplemental service to do the same effect. Putting double cooks, for example, would not be allowed, but using two hall boys to get a bonus from separate guests would be okay. Servants borrowed in this way go back to the teammate's expended service at the end of the active player's turn. And the inactive player could use an anytime effect in order to refresh a servant for the other player to use. The active player can invite the teammate's family cards or any starter casual guests to join their own activity. Non-starters and prestige cannot be invited in this way. When this happens, the favours are divided up in a fairly specific way. All starter card favours go to the active player. Family money favours or invite favours go to the player of your choice. And reputation or dismissal favours go to the teammate, that is, the player who owns the family card. Any invited teammate guests go back to the teammate's discount pile. Once the game is over, each player counts up their final scores like usual. Then you'll combine them. For the objectives, you'll pick the total team's top three scoring objectives. So in this case, it would be 23 points. For the reputation, you'll take the lower of the team's two reputation numbers. So here, 15. For all others, take the average rounded down. The team with the highest score wins. Finally, there is the Tableau variant, which uses this side of the round tracker board, and this is a version which removes most of the luck and randomizing elements from the game. To set up, you will use the milestones, and you'll draft your starter guests, which is one of the variants in the base game. You'll go through the objective deck and remove everything labeled Group Bonus. These are the ones that give you points for having a specific combination of buildings. However, you don't give anybody any objectives at the start of the game. These only come into play off victory point cards or the main library building. You'll use the low scoring upstairs downstairs monuments, and there are no theme cards and no Fairchilds. There is a new endless round tracker, and you'll go round and round the track until someone has reached max reputation at the end of their turn. If you're playing the two-player Tableau Duel, you'll also use the 9-10 chit to extend the game. The round track results in the Builder's Reserve starting earlier, and a new event called the Grand Ball, in which all players draw three prestige guests and choose one to keep. You should use the Queen Victoria drafting variant from the base game, where the cheapest building is removed and a new one added at the end of each round. When it comes to counting up your final score, the number of things you'll gain points for is much more limited. You will still gain both positive and negative points for any improvement tiles in your estate. But when you count up your gentry cards, you will not score any positive points from these cards, only the negatives. You'll still score objectives if you have any, and you'll score your milestones. You'll score your reputation wheel in full. You do not get any points for servants or leftover wealth, and there's no courtship in the game. But if you've gained any victory point cards, you do score them. The player with the highest score wins. And that's how to play the Upstairs, Downstairs and Wessex expansions for Obsession. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you find this video useful, please help us by hitting that like button. Subscribe to us. You can also hit the meeple in the corner to do so. And hit the bell icon so you'll know when we have new videos. You can also follow me on Instagram for my board games journey. Questions, comments and feedback are all welcome in the comment section below. Thanks for watching and see you next time.